are gathering him as 108. Good morning. It's good to uh, be back this morning and uh, worshiping together. I have one announcement that uh, next Sunday morning at uh, 9.30, there's going to be a uh, priesthood meeting here at the church. So uh, your presence is requested. So uh, we'll join again together next Sunday. It's uh, great to see everybody back this morning. Uh, in person and in church. I want to thank uh, you for your attendance, both in person and uh, on Zoom for this morning's worship service. Uh, I think we're going to see a, an awakening in our lives as we move forward into this new year. After uh, several hours of uh, testing, we uh, have the new audio-visual system up and running. And today uh, we're testing it out so you folks that are on Zoom can uh, report back to Roxanne uh, how we did. And if we, uh, if we sound fine and if we look fine, uh, then uh, our thanks to uh, Roxanne. The call to worship this morning is uh, taken from... Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the World Church has uh, worship helps that provide uh, assistance to us that are uh, presiding and speaking. And so uh, this, this is uh, taken from there. It's a, um, um, takeoff on, on uh, the uh, Psalms, the uh, 37th verse. I'm a little backwards this morning because my printer was printing both sides, so I'm going to go back up a little bit. Uh, if you're if you're noticing because of uh, what was published in the uh, uh, worship uh, helps that are that are going to uh, who's going to be speaking and so forth uh, today on in the service helps you'll find the word special and TBA, which means to be announced. 
So it's uh, great to be considered special this morning for those of us that are uh, for helping in the service. Um, <clears throat> we uh, shuffled the deck a little bit, and the reason is because on the 27th of March is going to be a uh, Midlands Mission Center worship service during this time period. And so we, uh, the uh, Mission Road pres uh, pastorate has, uh, in is encouraging us as a congregation to watch that on Zoom and, and to uh, be able to participate in that. So the deck's been shuffled somewhat. And uh, Ron and I were on there. I was going to preside and Ron was going to speak. And Ron's in snowy Colorado, and I'm in snowy Prairie Village. So uh, I'm always happy to uh, serve in the Lord's work and to uh, help wherever I can. So <clears throat> I do want to thank uh, those special people that are participating in today's service. Dorothy May, as you see, is uh, on, at the piano. Jim Needham's going to provide our invocation, and Russ May is going to share in the prayer for peace. Uh, Jerry Rushwell is uh, here on the rostrum with me and is going to provide a testimony on today's theme, mercy. Kenitha Cutler is going to offer the disciples' generous response. Roxanne Kosmicki is back there running the audiovisual system and making sure that things work for everyone that's on Zoom as well as in-house. Paul Bennett is acting as co-host, and uh, Sharon Wood, at the, if you're on Zoom and see the uh, credits at the end, she helps us uh, stay legal and, and uh, provides all those uh, credits and, and copyright information that we need to uh, publish on our Zoom. So I want to thank everyone for your help in today's service and uh, for you here in the home at, at, who are attending. It's good to see all your smiling faces. Today's worship is uh, taken, as I've said, from the worship helps provided in the World Church and can be found on the website. And today's text is adapted from Psalms, the 37th chapter. Don't worry about the wicked or envy wrong endures, they will fade like the grass and wither like green herbs. Trust in the Lord and do good. You will live safely and enjoy confidence. Delight in the Lord who gives you the desires of your heart. Commit your life to the Lord. Trust in God. God will make you shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not worry over those who prosper in their way or those who carry out evil works. Stop being angry. Reject this madness. Do not worry. It leads only to evil. The wicked will be cut off while those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In a little while, the wicked will be no more, and even though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. The humble will inherit the land and delight in abundant prosperity. The salvation of the righteousness is from the Lord. God is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them from the wicked and saves them because God is their sanctuary. Trust in the Lord and do good always. Amen. Shall we stand and sing together this morning hymn 118, Great and Marvelous Are Thy Works, followed by the invocation from Jim Needham.
Good morning, everyone. Good to be back. Let us pray. Now we are all together in person, church at last. Let us not forget that basic gospel we learned as kids in the past. We are all sinners saved by the blood of Christ, but we must not take that for granted. We too must pay a price. That price is righteousness and asking the Lord for forgiveness and repent of our sins so that on judgment day in heaven, we can all enter in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The prayer for peace today is uh, supposed to be related to Kenya. Uh, Kenya's a, a good something that's dear to my heart because Dorothy and I have been there. I was there once for a couple of weeks. Dorothy was there for six weeks as the librarian of a slum school. And we have what we call our pseudo child, <laughs> Oscar Anyango, who uh, is, is from Kenya also. His parents have spent, have uh, been at our house for uh, well, his mother was there for a week and his dad was, what, three weeks? And uh, actually at the slum school, the, uh, the director was at our house for a couple of days also. Anyway, today in our prayers, we remember the people of Kenya, a nation in East Africa with territory on the equator. Kenya's diverse and expansive terrain includes beautiful lakes, tropical coastlines, savanna, deserts, forests, and mountains. Kenya is known for its safaris. We were on two of them. Its national parks and Lake Victoria, the largest tropical freshwater lake in the world. Now for the prayer for peace. God of peace, we ask that you fill us with your peace so that we may be able to share your peace with others. God of love, open our hearts to the way of your love so we may share your gracious love with all we meet. God who sees and hears all, grant that we may have your sight so we may see those who are in need. Grant that we may hear as you hear so we may truly listen to those who are hurting. God of welcome, grant us this gift of welcoming so that we may welcome those who are in need, welcome those who are hurting, welcome those who need a friend, 
welcomed those who have found their way home. All this we ask in the, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is taken from uh, Genesis, the 45th chapter, um, <clears throat> the first through the 15th verses. It is a bit long, but um, if you remember right, um, this is about um, Joseph, and uh, Joseph was sold into uh, Egypt by his brothers. Uh, remember the story of the coat of many colors? And this is later in the life of Joseph after he has been in Egypt a while and has uh, become the Pharaoh's um, leader for, for the Egyptian nation. And um, so um, Joseph's family um, is, is suffering in their land where they live because there's been a, a drought and um, it's, it's just the beginning of the drought. Based, <clears throat> excuse me, basically. And so um, Joseph's brothers come to visit him, not knowing that Joseph is the leader of the land, basically, and uh, is the Pharaoh's uh, right-hand man. And uh, so they come, come to him, and uh, this, this is from uh, chapter 44. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in, in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not, there, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me here to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a prosperity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was, was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me father to Pharaoh, the Lord of all his house, and the ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up unto my father, and say to him, Thus saith your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children, and your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. There will be provided for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all of that that you have seen and that you should hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after this, his brothers talked with him. This passage of Genesis is about Joseph's reconciliation with his family. He met his speechless brothers and asked about his fathers. He told them not to be angry with themselves for selling him, Joseph, into slavery, but to be happy because Joseph has a place where he is now a ruler. He wants to provide for their families so that they will not, um, so that they not only survive the famine, but will grow and become very wealthy. 
Joseph does not bring up the past. He does not relive the story or the story of his brothers. He is saying all is forgiven and forgotten. They are being saved right now. His powerful story is foundation for understanding God's compassion and forgiveness within our discipleship journey. We all make mistakes such as hurtful comments, thriving on competition, being unforgiving, and indifferent. The good news is that we can lay our hurtful acts before one another, repenting of that which separates us from one another. When we repent, God opens the way towards compassion and healing. It is hard work. To be the people of God, to work for peace, we must accept and bear witness of God's reconciling grace. When have you sought forgiveness? When have you extended forgiveness? Why do you think that forgiveness and reconciliation are so hard to put into practice? How is the Spirit nudging you to reconcile a broken or damaged relationship? <clears throat> Are you familiar with the um, term mercy rule in sports? The mercy rule is one that if a team is ahead by an overwhelming lead, the game ends so as not to drag out the humiliation of the losing team. When Karen and I decided to move to Overland Park, it was because we wanted to watch our grandkids grow up. At that time, we lived in La Crescent, Minnesota, which was eight hour drive. And we both had good jobs, but our youngest daughter, Beth, and her husband, Dwayne, were expecting. Another reason was that our parents were getting older and we wanted to be close to support them. Well, we, we've been here about 20 years. We have watched them grow up. We may not have been as active in their lives as we would have liked to, but we have tried. Beth's youngest son, Carter, is an avid sports fan. He's all about the Chiefs, and he even named his dog Chief. He's also a big fan of basketball and a pretty good player for his age. He's in junior high. Last year, we traveled to several of his tournament games around the different cities and here in uh, Springfield and uh, down by the, uh, lost it, <laughs> Lake of the Ozarks and South. <clears throat> the teams he played with were all called traveling teams. So they weren't school teams or uh, any, anything like that. Made up of local kids from the community. Carter doesn't play on his, high sc on his school team. Beth teaches in a neighborhood town and he plays with the boys from that town. It's not the school's team there either. Just boys that want to play basketball. It seems that whatever team Carter is on, they wind up being the underdogs. Sometimes they have five players and sometimes they have more. Sometimes you wonder about the mercy rule. Yesterday was a weekend tournament in the St. Joe area. Last night, Karen and I went to Wathena, Kansas to be a part of the cheering section. Altogether, there were about six of us to cheer on five boys. Karen and I got there in time to watch the last two of four games yesterday. One game at one o'clock, another one at four o'clock. We watched the last two, the one at six and the final game at eight. These boys were up against some tough competition. The boys had lost their first three games. The way tournaments go is a countdown to the end. Well, the fourth and the last game was against the first seed team. So the burden was on the cheering section of six people to encourage these five boys to win against the first seed team made up of nine or 10 boys. Carter's coach is a past student at Beth's school, and when he played 
few years ago, they went to state. So the coach changed the strategy a little bit for the last game. You have five boys that have played hard for three games, and now they're up against the first seed team. The other team was ahead at the half, and Carter's team struggled to catch up with the score, but the cheering section kept up the encouragement. When the buzzer sounded to end the game, the score was tied. Overtime. We were all on the edge of our seats as the game started. Only two minutes in the overtime session to win or lose the game. It was a tough pot fought battle for possession of the ball. When the buzzer sounded to end the overtime session, there was only one point separating the winners from the losers. Our cheering section had pulled them through and Carter's team had won. Well, maybe it wasn't the cheering section, but you can't help but wonder if the cheering may have helped some. <clears throat> One might have thought with a record of losses of Carter's team, the mercy rule might have been a choice, but the boys came together to face the challenge and defeat the other team. Sometimes when you face what may seem like an unsurmountable odds, but you find strength to win out. Joseph family's case was, <clears throat> were reaching for desperation to go to G Egypt to ask for help. Little did they know that God had gone before them to turn a bad deed of selling their brother into a miracle to save their lives. We are all called to be example of God's compassion, compassion to everyone, even our opponents, those who have done wrong to us and those who have, are considered our enemies. Even if you aren't playing a game, what might be the mercy rule for life? There are people who fall behind in life. How do we show mercy to them? Remain seated as we sing hymn 197. As already shown in our worship this morning, our theme is to show mercy. And my assignment is to share some personal thoughts and experience that center upon mercy. And in response to that, I soon thought of a sermon that Paul Edwards preached years ago here in our congregation right here. It, was about God's mercy and what it meant for each of us as children of God. And he then said that whenever he might be called after death to appear before God and answer for his life, he would not be begging for justice. He would be begging for, for mercy. For only by the grace and mercies of God and Jesus Christ do we have real hope, not only in this world, 
but also in any afterlife to come. Well, I remember thinking how sobering, although hopeful, was Paul's statement about God's mercy. But the hope and reality of God's mercy was not something new. I had heard it before. But after Paul Edwards thus reminded me, I remember well my own thoughts. To me, Paul Edwards was sort of a pillar of righteousness. And if he must ask God for mercy, what hope do I have? But the answer was immediate. God is a God of mercy. And God extends his mercies to every one of us when and as we do our best to be faithful and true to our callings and our promises to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. And I was glad to hear again emphatically affirmed by Paul Edwards that God is indeed a God of mercy. Even with our failures and shortcomings, God continues to renew our hopes and our calls each one of us to repentance. So you and I, every one of us as a child of God and our Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father would have each one of us to remember that every day of our lives respond accordingly and share with others the assurance of a God who is merciful. Well, I thought of Paul Edwards and his sermon as I considered what I should share here this morning. It was suggested to me that I, sh I share a personal experience that involves first extending mercy to someone and two, that it happened while I was serving either in the U.S. Army back in the 1950s or as a magistrate judge in the United States District Court for the District of Kansas during the years 1985 through 2017. So in response to that suggestion, I've chosen a case from my service as a judge. The case was a criminal prosecution against the sheriff of Wyandotte County. He was appearing in front of me to answer criminal charges for his alleged mistreatment of a black prisoner. The sheriff had forcibly removed the prisoner from his hospital confinement without any medical improvement, any medical approval, and thus in violation of his constitutional rights. Asserting his legal authority, the sheriff had simply overruled the medical staff. He and his deputy had then transported the defendant to the Wyandotte County Courthouse for a scheduled hearing, followed by his return to the hospital for his further care. At the request of the prisoner and his family, the U.S. attorney presented the evidence to a grand jury, who then returned a criminal indictment against the sheriff for his allegedly illegal treatment. Under the Fifth Amendment, the alleged violation was the illegal custody and transport of a black defendant from his hospital care. That is a civil rights violation based upon race. Upon conviction, the sheriff would face a possible sentence of imprisonment up to one year and up to a $10,000 fine. The criminal proceeding thus appeared on my docket, and at an early hearing, the defendant sheriff entered a plea of not guilty. So we set deadlines for pretrial procedures and a date for a jury trial. But a few weeks later, I received another motion on behalf of the defendant sheriff. He would change his plea to guilty. After further hearing, I entered a plea of guilty and set a date for sentencing. At sentencing, the courtroom gallery was fully occupied for this unusual criminal case against a sheriff. There were local newspaper staff, including an illustrator for the Kansas City Star, complete with sketchbook and crayons. To sentence a person to imprisonment is not an easy task be it for days or months or years. And there is often uncertainty or doubt as to whether or not the court has indeed reached the best conclusion of the case. How will this sentence affect a defendant's family and other persons? What is the most responsible conclusion to any case in which a defendant leaves a spouse, children, family, friends, or otherwise 
others who may depend on him. In some cases, those concerns predominate, and in other cases, they hardly exist or may be otherwise negated. And in any case, what is the role of mercy? In this case, there were a number of mitigating factors. The defendant sheriff had a commendable record in law enforcement for over 20 years. Our federal probation officer who had prepared the pre-sentence report had provided what appeared to be reliable information. The defendant sheriff had no other convictions or charges of misconduct. He conceded he was wrong and without adequate authority or excuse to remove the hospitalized patient to the courthouse. He could have pursued a different procedure or gained time or continuance from the state judge. Close to age 60, the defendant was in his last year of public service, ready to retire. His personal record contained no other violations of any consequence. He had served honorably in the United States Armed Forces during World War II. That was not necessarily a mitigating factor, but I could and I would consider it. With these factors and upon his plea of guilty, I sentenced the defendant to a term of imprisonment for six months and placed him on probation. There was no need for him to be confined. Upon completion of probation, his sentence would be commuted and the defendant would be without further criminal record. On the morning after sentencing, I opened our Kansas City Star newspaper. On the editorial page, I soon discovered that the cartoonist in our courtroom had indeed done her job. Her drawing showed that our court, and specifically me, did, not, did nothing more than slap the wrist of the defendant sheriff. And perhaps her cartoon was an appropriate critique. The popularity of the sentence did not necessarily make it right or wrong. Was the quality of mercy present in this case? Some may say yes, others no. But the instruction of Jesus Christ in his Sermon on the Mount yet remains for us a clear call. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew chapter 5. May you and I always know God's mercy in our lives. May we always be merciful to others. Jerry, I think you said it all. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We're called to offer mercy, compassion, and generosity. Joseph didn't have to provide for his brothers anything, but today we've learned that, uh, that he showed mercy and he showed generosity, just like God shows to us. And if you'll pray with me, Creator God, we praise you and we ask you to bless our offerings, our offerings of time, of talent, and of treasure. Just as Joseph showed mercy and generosity to his brothers, we thank you for the mercy that you show on us. May we respond with the generosity to others and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand and sing our closing hymn, 637?
The sending forth today is taken from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 163, 4, A and B. God, the eternal creator, weeps for the poor, displaced, mistreated, and diseased of the world because of their unnecessary suffering. Such conditions are not God's will. Open your ears to hear the pleading of mothers and fathers in all nations who desperately seek a future of hope for their children. Do not turn away from them, for in their welfare resides your welfare. The earth, lovingly created as an environment for life to flourish, shudders in distress because creation's natural and living systems are becoming exhausted from carrying the burdens of human greed and conflict. Humankind must awaken from its illusion of independence and unrestrained consumption without lasting consequences. May we go this morning thinking of those in our lives that we meet that may need to be shown mercy. Thank you. 